This is the story of the greatest power in the world, motivated and led by devout Christians. A power which pursued its political ambitions with a missionary and jingoistic zeal as it clashed with an Islamic fundamentalist. A self-proclaimed redeemer who for some years was the West's most wanted man. This clash of worlds happened over a century ago in Sudan, when an Islamic revival swept through this desert land, took on British Christian rule and trounced it. A Taliban-style Islamic State was established. Some might say the purest form of Islam ever to have existed. The British went to great lengths to destroy the Islamists. Yet this Sudanese story of religious revival continues to inspire modern-day militants. A hundred years later, and Sudan once again became home to a modern-day Muslim redeemer, hell-bent on the destruction of the West. At the end of the 19th century, Sudan, a vast area of tribal fiefdoms stretching 1,200 miles south of Egypt, was ruled from Cairo. Then, as the Suez Canal became strategically important as a route to India, the British took over the running of Egypt, and so added Sudan to a list of imperial possessions that covered a quarter of the population of the world. With Britain at the zenith of its power, any challenge to its supremacy was ruthlessly cut down. And that was what happened one October morning in 1898. British troops stood in the Sudanese desert facing tens of thousands of Muslim tribesmen, dervishes who had the temerity to rise up in an Islamic jihad against British rule. Now they would be punished. On their commander's word, the dervishes advanced towards the British lines, screaming, There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Hours later, and they lay dead in their thousands. For the British, the Battle of Omdurman was a day of reckoning, a day of revenge against the upstart savages. This Islamic experiment was surely finished. But Omdurman did not merely become another footnote in imperial history. For the Sudanese, the memory is still very much alive. On the battle site, now surrounded by the suburban sprawl of Omdurman, the British built this memorial to the men of the 21st Lancers who died. The monument is surrounded by two tall protective fences. Inside, the ground is littered with stones thrown by a public resentful of this symbol of infidel triumphalism. And every day, twice a day, the leader of the Islamic revolt is remembered in prayer. For the purity of his thought and for his victories over a moralistic and intrusive Britain 120 years before.
Back in the 18th century, the British saw Africa merely as an easy and profitable source of slaves. But by the mid-19th century, the Victorians aspired to bring light to the dark continent. Slavery had become an affront to the Christian ethic and the imperial project. And nowhere was this more true than in the Sudan, where a vast and ruthless slave trade flourished. The anti-slavery movement was the British Empire's evangelical soul. From its roots at Holy Trinity Church in Clapham, London, for a hundred years, abolitionism had been preached around the world with missionary zeal by William Wilberforce and his fellow Christians. The people who worshipped here were people who read the book, uh, who read the Bible, and they read the stories of the people of God being captured and uh, taken into exile in, in Egypt, where they were turned into slaves and into units and means of production uh, for, for, for Pharaoh's self-aggrandizement. Um, but, but the call of Moses was, was, let my people go. Let my people go. Yes, slavery was believed to make people unproductive, feckless and poor. By freeing them from slavery, one would make them effective individual producers, economically active. They would buy more goods, they would produce more. This would be a good thing for everyone. British Christians were determined to eliminate this blight on humanity in the Sudan. And they had just the man to do it. A maverick figure of inexhaustible energy and strident evangelical beliefs, Charles Chinese Gordon. He had fought bravely in the Crimea and defeated the Taiping Rebellion in China. This champion of the empire tempered his heroism with charity. He taught at a school for deprived children and gave away 90% of his colonel's salary to the poor. I assumed that Gordon of Khartoum would also be a person for whom personal conversion, private piety, the reading of scripture, um, the, the saying of his prayers, the walk with God, and also asking himself all the time, how does that actually work out in my life? How does that work out in, this, in society? How does it work out in the world that God loves so much that he sent his son to die for it? He believed that slavery and the slave trade were bad things and that the advancement of British influence should be associated with the abolition of the slave trade and the end of slavery. And this would make everyone better and everything happier. In 1877, under pressure from the British anti-slavery lobby, the Egyptian government officially appointed Gordon Governor-General of Sudan. There, this Christian abolitionist would come hard up against Islam, a religion that condoned slavery. It was to prove the beginning of an epic clash of worlds. <laughs> Three thousand years ago, the Nuba were conquered and enslaved by the Egyptians. Famous for their wrestling, their champions were taken from Sudan to fight in Egypt. By the time Gordon arrived, this slave trade had resurfaced with a vengeance, reaching well beyond Sudan's southern borders to tap into the rich human resources of Central Africa. In the 19th century, the slave trade flourished again in Sudan, as a Muslim population from the northern belt along the Nile, who now considered themselves Arabs, raided and bought slaves in the west and south. If this trade could be halted, slavery would be dealt a mortal blow.
Within a year, Gordon gave a bravado view of his success. I have scotched the slave trade. I am blockading all roads to the slave districts. And I expect to make the slave dealers, now in revolt, give in. I have indeed a very heavy task, for I have to do everything myself. To Sudanese Muslims, Gordon's presence was more offensive than the Egyptians. As a representative of a foreign power and a Christian, he was an infidel. Well, I think certainly many people in Sudan would have seen this as an entirely unwarranted foreign imposition and would have seen Gordon's religion as a further mark of the, the outrageousness of this attempt to impose foreign laws and indeed Christian culture and problem. Well, being oppressed by foreigners is always particularly offensive and being oppressed by foreigners of a different religion, especially so. Despite his boast, by the time Gordon left Sudan, sick and exhausted, in 1879, he had failed to eradicate slavery. But his time there had had an unseen effect. Incensed at the foreign intervention in their affairs, the Sudanese had found a leader. His name was Muhammad Ahmad, and he was, by all accounts, a remarkable man. Muhammad came from a long line of boat builders in a village on the Nile to the north of the capital, Khartoum. It was assumed that he would follow in his father's footsteps. He, from the start, uh, eschewed boat building and decided that his calling is that of scholarship. And consequently, he went to all the different traditional schools in Sudan to learn the Quran, to learn uh, the Arabic language. He grew up totally dedicated to uh, spiritual and uh, moral matters. <laughs> By the age of 11, Muhammad was able to recite the whole Quran from memory, some 400 pages. At the Quranic school in Khartoum, he was taught utter contempt for Muslim leaders who failed to ensure proper standards of faith, and, as he wrote, hatred for the corrupting force of infidel foreigners. They transgressed the command of God's messengers and of his prophets. They judged other than by God's revelation. They used to drag away your men and take captive your women and children and slay unrighteously the soul under God's protection. He began to see there was a great contradiction between the ideals of Islam that he knew and was committed to and the practice and it was this that began uh, his uh, revolutionary uh, view of matters and he began to say I am looking for someone who would lead a movement for change that I should support. According to Islamic prophecy, a leader would emerge who would establish a truly Islamic state. He would be called the Mahdi, a title that to this day has a powerful yet ominous resonance in the Muslim world. Traditional sources of Islam speak about 
a Mahdi who will come one day to reverse the trend of uh, decay and uh, revive Islam to the standard it was in its original time. According to this prophecy, for a chosen Mahdi to emerge, he has to meet a precise list of qualifications. His first name would be Muhammad. His father's name would be Abdullah. His features would be similar to those of Prophet Muhammad himself. He would be tall, powerfully built, with a broad forehead and a V-shaped aperture between the two front teeth. In 1871, Muhammad Ahmad moved to a remote island in the middle of the White Nile in western Sudan. Here he started to teach the Quran, and from time to time he would retreat to pray inside a cave which is now enshrined in this mosque. الناس اللي موجودين حول المنطقة بالنسبة لأخلاق الإمام المهدي عليه السلام وسماحة خلقه وعلم الغزير وتجويد القرآن والناس اللي موجودين في المنطقة اللي هو جاهم كضيف ينقلب الحب له أكثر من الشيخ زاد. In June 1881, Muhammad Ahmad reappeared after praying in his cave for four days without food and water. الإمام المهدي قال له يا محمد أخوي أنت ربيتني وأنا نشأت تحتك مما قمت إلى أما بلغت رشدي يوم من الأيام كذبت عليك قال له علي ولا غيري قط ما كذبت قال له أنا في محل ده هجمت علي المهدي الكبرى بأمر من الله ورسوله بأني أنا المهدي المنتظر That was how the new leader of an anti-Western jihad was revealed to the world. For a self-effacing religious scholar, the Mahdi's ambitions were extraordinary. In a nutshell, the revival, the revival of Islam, the unification of the Muslim world, and the liberation of the Muslim world and foreign domination. He must have been aware of the ferment of thought in the Islamic world at the time, the concern over the apparent relative decline of Islam as against the West, the feeling that Islam should somehow be renewed and revived. And since he was presumably aware of this larger debate, it is unsurprising that his ambitions stretch beyond the Sudan stretched to encompass the whole of the Muslim community in the world. He believed that he had been sent to revive and renew religion for all of them. To achieve his ambition, the Mahdi began to plan a military campaign. The grandfather of these men was the Mahdi's most trusted commander, Abu Ghazja. <laughs> أوقدها الله سبحانه وتعالى وأعدائي حولها كالفراش كل ما اقتربوا منها احترقوا وأمريكاش يعني هو مفتكر دينار أوقدت في شأن الله سبحانه وتعالى والأعداء حولها تاني مرة تانية يعني هيموتوا حولها بعد قدير ما كان في أي حاجة دنيوية فذي المهدي كان داير يخلي الناس يتجهوا لأن مع سورتهم دي قايم بها دي من أجل تحرير الوطن من أجل الدين ومن أجل الوطن ما من أجل المال ولا من أجل السلطة عشان كده from his Aba Island stronghold, the Mahdi confronted the Egyptian authorities. He sent this message to the capital, Khartoum. I declare that I am the expected Mahdi. He who follows me will be victorious. He who refuses will be punished by God. He who does not believe will be purified by the sword. 
Egypt's reply to the Mahdi was equally blunt. Two steamers packed with Egyptian troops were ordered by the British to drag him back to Khartoum in chains. The force arrived near Abba, where on the night of August the 12th, 1881, it promptly blundered into a trap. The soldiers of the Egyptian army had been massacred by a mere 300 sword-wielding Mahdists. This is the most important battle in the history of the Mahdiya. Why? Because if that battle, if, if the Mahdi was defeated in that battle, that was the end. If he succeeded, that was the beginning. He has to come. Other battles were more victories, but that was the beginning. That was the turning point in the military history of the Mahdiya. It didn't hurt the Mahdi's reputation that his victory matched almost exactly the description of the Battle of al Badr in the Quran. At the Battle of al Badr, the Prophet Muhammad had 313 fighters. The Mahdi had just over 300. Both battles took place on the 17th day of Ramadan. When the news of the victory spread, it is said that Muslims came from all over Africa to join the fight against the infidels. There was support in Egypt, there was support in North Africa, there was support in India, uh, there was uh, support all over the Muslim world uh, who uh, thought that this was a banner under which to fight. The idea was flourishing, flourishing. The Mahdi is coming because the idea of the Mahdi itself implies hope for the future, the expected Mahdi. More victories followed, but back in London, the press was dismissive. Like so many troubles on the fringes of the empire, the Mahdi was an annoyance that would soon go away. The Times reported that the town of El Obeid, with its garrison, was unconditionally surrendered to the Mahdi on the 17th. Dissension is, however, stated to exist among the false prophet's followers, and many are expected to join the government troops when they advance. The British government was far more concerned with its substantial investments in Egypt. Sudan seemed entirely peripheral. But that was all about to change. Following the debacle at Abba Island, the Egyptians ensured that their next attempt to destroy this troublesome fundamentalist would be led by an Englishman, one of the British Empire's most experienced troubleshooters, Colonel William Hicks. On September the 9th, 1883, Hicks's force of 7,000 men left Omdurman entered the unforgiving arid landscape and slogged into Cordofan province's thorny Shekan forest. But Shekan uh, was led by this uh, British officer and the idea was that this was the battle that was going, this was the campaign that was going to finish uh, the Mahdi and his movement. 
In fact, Hicks and his Egyptian soldiers were once again comprehensively outfoxed by the Mahdi. They meet a, a continuous march of attrition. Right from the start, I mean, the Mahdi the appointed people who would harass uh, the army throughout uh, its march westwards. It is this continuous attrition that really did the job of demoralizing uh, Hicks's army, of uh, preparing them really for their fate. As this official Sudanese reconstruction celebrates, hundreds of miles into the desert, Hicks and his 7,000 men died in the slaughter. To the Sudanese, the victory at Sheikhan made the Mahdi seem infallible. As he strengthened his grip on the country, the Mahdi began to introduce Islamic Sharia law. Even by the standards of the time, the Mahdi's rules were strict. As far as women go, they should control their desires and find themselves to home and not go out unless strictly necessary. A woman with uncovered hair, even for the blink of an eye, deserves 27 lashes. He who calls a fellow Muslim a dog, a pig, a Christian, or a sodomite should be punished with 80 lashes and seven days imprisonment. The penalty for a man caught talking to a woman who is not his relative is 27 lashes. Smiling, chewing, or sniffing tobacco all deserve 80 lashes. Widowed or divorced women caught having sex were executed by burying them to their necks in the earth as horsemen galloped over them until they were dead. The slave trade was immediately legalized. The Mahdi sent letters around the world proclaiming his divine status and invoking a global jihad. Now, finally, he was a threat and he had the attention of the world. The danger of the, 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 the movement led by, by my grandfather at the time was that it, it promised to undo all the designs by the European uh, powers against the world of Islam and against Africa. Uh, and it indicated the uh, danger of a revolt which could uh, entice Muslims to uprise and also entice Africans uh, to overthrow uh, the um, colonialist uh, regime. And, and, and therefore, it was uh, necessary to sniff it out in order to stop this uh, threat. The Mahdi controlled the countryside. Now he had to rid Sudan of a city that was the epitome of evil. The Mahdi had to take Khartoum. He ordered his forces to close in on the city. When he heard about the Mahdi's successes, the first reaction of British Prime Minister William Gladstone was to wash his hands of the whole affair. He suggested that the Egyptian government leave the country to its own devices. But public opinion demanded that a price be paid for Hicks's death. Someone had to deal with the upstart Mahdi once and for all. In the popular view, who better to pick than a man who had defended Shanghai heroically against a rebellion led by a self-proclaimed messiah? A man who had trained in siege tactics. The experienced Sudan campaigner, Charles Gordon. The 
British Empire's favorite troubleshooter. Gordon fitted perfectly the Victorian heroic ideal of a moral titan taking on and defeating the dark forces that threaten civilization. While the British public was clamoring for its hero to trounce the Islamic fundamentalists, Gordon was indulging his favorite hobby in Jerusalem, mapping the last journey of Christ. Despite the popular acclaim, choosing to send this Christian maverick to Sudan was risky for the government. Remember, this was a problem that had come to them very, very suddenly, and they were looking for a swift solution. They knew that Gordon was, in some ways, an unstable and maverick figure, but they also believed him to be influential and effective. Gladstone eventually succumbed to the moral interventionists, but he dispatched Gordon to Sudan with strict orders to do no more than evacuate foreigners from the city. But on his journey down the Nile from Egypt, the evacuation of Khartoum was the last thing on Gordon's mind. Gordon's assessment of the Mahdi was, I think, consistently wrong. As soon as he knew about the situation, Gordon seems to have decided that the Mahdi was just one of many figures, religious reformers or revivalists, who sprang up from time to time and who could be suppressed with relatively little effort. Accompanying Gordon down the Nile was his adjutant and admirer, Colonel James Stewart. This is a page from Stewart's journal. It describes their journey down to Khartoum on their way ostensibly to begin the evacuation of the Egyptian garrisons there. And what one sees very clearly from the journal at this point is how Gordon's mind is always racing ahead. It's always formulating some new idea, some new plan. And so, as Stuart records Gordon's word, as soon as the Egyptian troops were withdrawn, they, the Sudanese people, might make application to HM government to give them HM support and to be a protecting power to the Sudan. So, Gordon, having less than three weeks before been explicitly instructed that Her Majesty's government had no intention of assuming any responsibility for the Sudan, went on to make a public pronouncement to encourage the people of the Sudan in the belief that Britain would take over the role of protecting power. Gordon arrived in Khartoum as a saviour. The market was festooned with bunting and coloured lamps. There was a firework display. After an assessment of the security situation, he reported back to Cairo that Khartoum was as safe as Kensington Park. Gordon then sent the Mahdi words of greeting, a red ceremonial robe and a pasha's fez. He offered to make the Mahdi Sultan of Kordofan if the uprising came to an immediate halt. This was the beginning of a nine-month correspondence. Gordon announced that this was a technique to discredit the Mahdi and to divide his following. He believed that the Mahdi ultimately would not be able to resist these kind of earthly temptations and that in succumbing to them he would lose his reputation. The Mahdi wrote back declining and saying that he would expect Gordon himself instead to offer allegiance to him as the Mahdi and to join his movement and to become one of his followers. And very famously, he sent Gordon a jibba, one of the, the garments worn by the Ansar, the followers of the Mahdi. Gordon's reaction to that gift was, I think it's fair to say, tempestuously angry, that he uh, declined this in the most strident terms and demonstratively threw away the jibba. You know, I think Gordon himself uh, did not have any 
signs of respect to the Mahdi. He has the same or had the same type of ethnocentricity that many Western leaders uh, show towards uh, leaders in my part of the world. Gordon ignored his orders to evacuate Khartoum and decided instead to smash up the Mahdi. He was to be a hero. But for Gordon, Khartoum was to be no Shanghai. By December of 1884, the city was surrounded by the Mahdi's army. But Gordon still managed to send a telegram to Cairo saying, Khartoum is all right, could hold out for years. Days later, as the Mahdi's forces continued to close in on the city, the telegraph lines were cut. Despite having Gordon at his mercy, the Mahdi made every attempt to avoid bloodshed. Khalid Idris's grandfather, Abu Ghazah, was given charge of the attack on the city by the Mahdi. He wouldn't attack or make a siege of any place without writing many times to convince the people that we don't want bloodshed. Uh, we should avert um, um, these calamities and uh, bloodshed. And in that sense, he wrote to General Gordon. He pleaded with him so much that we will return you to your people with honor, that we don't want to fight you, that uh, we know that you have great respect f with your people. So please, let's, let's call the, this encounter off. But General Gordon was quite, if I may say, stubborn, and he couldn't at all change his mind. He, he, he believes that he has a mission and he'll stick to it. Uh, well, he said, in fact, um, I will not leave this place if, if, if that means my life. Sir, betrayed by his own government, an we abandoned... We feel more system. interest in the safety of General Gordon than in any We other feel matter. that every day wasted puts a nail into Gordon's coffin. is chest entirely due to the supineness and neglect of the British government, as an Indian force government. should be... Or can alive. there be a more terrible example of faithlessness on the part of a government than this? The press and public blamed the Prime Minister Gladstone for abandoning their hero Gordon to the barbarians. Against his will, Gladstone finally ordered British forces to leave Cairo and begin the 1,600-mile journey across the unforgiving desert to relieve Khartoum. Against fierce resistance from the Mahdist forces, the relief column made painfully slow progress. When he wasn't dealing with desertions among his troops, Gordon would spend hours on top of the governor's palace, scanning the horizon for the relief force that failed to materialize. Instead, he saw only thousands of the Mahdist dervish soldiers preparing for battle. By that stage, it must have been very, very clear to Gordon that things had gone wrong and that his hope that the British government would send a force to relieve or support him was also um, at least premature, if not entirely erroneous. Your situation is hopeless. People have revolted all over the Sudan, so your escape routes are completely uh, shut. The incoming uh, force to relieve you will not be able to relieve you because we uh, have all the access routes uh, completely besieged. And, and therefore, uh, please, he pleaded so much, let us call this encounter off. Gordon seemed resigned to his fate. In one of his last letters to his sister Augusta, this Christian hero put his fate in God's hands. 
I think that our Lord is ruling all things to the glory of his kingdom and cannot wish things were different than they are. I have done my best for the honor of our country. Goodbye. Khartoum had held out for a staggering 317 days until the night of January the 25th, 1885. There was a council, Mahdi's uh, Khalifas. They decided that it is right time for invading Khartoum. Al Mahdi himself crossed the river that night and he preached his Ansars and um, convey to them this is the night, this is, a, this is what we've been waiting for. During the Mahdi final talk to his people, to the soldiers, to Ansar, the night of the attack on Khartoum, he ordered them or advised them not to kill certain specific number of people among them was Gordon himself. Europe, you Europeans don't want to believe this. You think that the Mahdi was a, uh, a bloodthirst man. I, I don't think so. He never liked that. Yeah, in the case of Gordon, he said he didn't want Gordon to be killed. He wanted him to, uh, to be with him. But the polite exchange of letters had stopped. The Mahdi's diplomatic gestures were now replaced by a ruthless military will. In the early hours of the morning, 50,000 of the Mahdi's dervishes swarmed over Khartoum's defenses. They butchered citizens and soldiers, enslaved their captives, and sent girls to harems. Gordon was trapped in his palace and speared to death. Then, his head was cut off and paraded through the streets. Two days later, the relief expedition finally arrived. In Britain, the sacrifice of Gordon sent a convulsion through society. This was, if you like, a double blow, the death of the man himself, but also the failure of British arms to rescue him. And this was seen very much as a, as a national calamity, and there was an extraordinary outpouring of national grief, not perhaps entirely unprecedented, but certainly on a, a, an extraordinary scale. It's very difficult to think of a comparative event within, within that period of British history. <laughs> In Sudan, people prayed in celebration. Although the Mahdi had united the country against foreign rule and defeated the greatest empire the world had ever seen, he didn't live to see his dream of a new Islamic state. Six months after Gordon's head was paraded around the ruins of Khartoum, the Mahdi died of typhus. Under his chosen successor, the Khalifa, the Mahdi's legacy lived on in the establishment of a vast and aggressive Sudanese state, the Mahdiya. But the Khalifa lacked the political skills to hold the country together. And as the years went by, tribal infighting began to destabilize the country. 
But it's typical of all revolutions, of course. They are very successful when it comes to defense and resistance and jihad. But then even when you conquer, when you achieve, you don't know how to build. <laughs> you, you may be capable of, of destroying the, the enemy, but you don't know how to build your own model. In London, the instability of the fledgling Islamic nation was now seen as a real threat to Egypt, Britain's key strategic interest in the region. For the British, it was quite clear that uh, there will be no stability in Egypt uh, if Sudan was ruled by and controlled by a hostile nationalist uh, uh, regime. The Mahdist state was an exception, and this could not be tolerated. To justify a new military operation against the Mahdiya, Sudan was presented to the British public as a human rights disaster. In a carefully orchestrated campaign by a man who idolized Gordon. He was another imperial Christian evangelist, Reginald Wingate. Wingate, as head of intelligence for the Egyptian army, made it his business to disparage the Mahdiya as a corrupt and oppressive state. This was a matter of revenge, pure and simple. Now, there is no doubt whatsoever that all reference to the uh, oppression, the corruption, and so on, is an exaggeration. Winget did encourage all uh, writers to character assassinate uh, the leaders of the, uh, of the Mahdist state, and also to depict it as uh, corrupt, oppressive in order to persuade public opinion in Britain to support the campaign to avenge Gordon. Yet the Madia was not going to self-destruct. It had to be defeated. Thirteen years were to pass before the British saw their martyr avenged and they had to go to extraordinary lengths to do it. It took army engineers two years to build a railway from Egypt south across the Sahara Desert to Khartoum. 2,000 miles of track laid at three miles a day for the sole purpose of transporting an army of 20,000 soldiers to eliminate an enemy of the empire. This force was led by the ideal Christian warrior, a ruthless military technician and deeply devout man. Like Wingate, General Herbert Horatio Kitchener was one of Gordon's most avid admirers. When he found out that the invasion of Sudan had been ordered by the British government, Kitchener danced with joy. Now Kitchener and Wingate had the chance to avenge their hero and teach the dervishes an unforgettable lesson. What happened here at Omdurman in 1898 was the zenith of Victorian imperialism. The last hurrah of the generation that regarded world domination as its manifest destiny. The Battle of Omdurman was to pit the full military might of the biggest empire the world had seen against an army of desert tribesmen. This map shows where two worlds clashed. On one side, 50,000 desert-dwelling Islamic fundamentalists spread out across the plain of Karari. On the other, 20,000 well-drilled British and Egyptian soldiers with their backs to the Nile. 
Standing in the British lines was the young Winston Churchill, a Harrow-educated army officer who had wangled his way into the force as a war correspondent for the Morning Post. What he saw astonished him. The dervishes were now two miles distant, their line being, I estimated, four to five miles long and hundreds deep. It seemed to envelop our force altogether and was truly an amazing sight. They were chanting ceaselessly, La laha illa illa wa Muhammad Rasul Allah. There is one God and Muhammad is the messenger of God. For Churchill, who rode fearlessly with the 21st Lancers into the dervish lines, this was the most thrilling adventure imaginable. The event seemed to pass in absolute silence. The yells of the enemy, the clashing of sword and spear, were unnoticed by the senses. The picture lasted only a moment, but the memory remains forever. The hungry and attentive Maxims opened fire on them, sweeping them all to the ground. Some in death, others in terror. Kitchener called a halt to the massacre by saying, Cease fire, cease fire, please. What a dreadful waste of ammunition. The Mahdist revolution had been blown apart by the discipline and firepower of a superior army. Eleven thousand dervishes died that day, and only 48 British and Egyptian soldiers. With the British and Egyptians now directly installed as Sudan's joint colonial rulers, that, finally, should have been the end of the Mahdi and his Sudanese Jihad. I was in the base of the building when this... Describe what you saw. You saw the second plane. Uh, looked like a deliberate act. A deliberate act. Oh, just watching it burn and people were jumping out of it. it was horrible. The terror tactics of Al-Qaeda are the defining images of the early 21st century. A global network of dedicated militants striking fear into the heart of the West. The foundation for this organization was constructed in Sudan. Throughout British colonial rule in the 20th century, the Mahdi had remained a potent symbol of Sudanese resistance to foreign influence. Then, after 35 years of failed self-government, in 1985, Hassan al-Turabi, Sudan's spiritual leader, formulated a purest Islamic state which echoed the Mahdi's. In 1991, he warmly welcomed Osama bin Laden into the country, fresh from his triumph against the Soviet army in Afghanistan. Anyone who fights the Russians to you is a resistant mujahid. But once the Russians have gone, he himself retroactively becomes a terrorist. He, he is not a terrorist at all. Remarkably similar in appearance to the Mahdi, Osama bin Laden came ostensibly as a rich Saudi businessman to invest in the Sudanese economy and to help develop some of the poorest areas. He bought over a million acres of agricultural land, established food processing plants and a complex network of trading companies. One of his construction businesses built a highway 1,200 kilometers across the desert from Khartoum to the Red Sea. It was also in Sudan that bin Laden set up camps in which hundreds of his followers could be trained in paramilitary tactics. It was from here that fighters were sent to Chechnya and Bosnia, and where attacks on targets in Saudi Arabia and the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were planned. Bin Laden internationalized his terror network in Sudan. This was the start of Al-Qaeda. The fire does not touch 
covered in dust than the cause of Allah. Despite the differences between Mahdism and Al Qaeda, they represent attempts to deal with the same perceived problem the weakness of Islam in the face of a dominant and corrupting foreign influence. Muslims can look at what they perceive to be the, the control, the influence, the political and economic power of Europe and say, this is something that's been done to us. This is, our position has been undermined deliberately and we must act against this. And the way that we can remedy our situation is to revive and renew our religion. And that should be the basis of a new Islamic culture. The resentment of uh, the involvement of the foreigners in the Islamic world is really very great, very strong. And that's why people who are living in, uh, in misery, in uh, dictatorial regimes, in poverty, they think they can do something similar to what happened before in Islam. In bin Laden's case, there has been no Kitchener. In 1996, he was exiled from Sudan to Afghanistan at America's request. The Mahdi's memory continues to inspire a new generation. The appeal of his message reflecting the collective pride he touched among some Sudanese. لا زال الناس في أجيالنا الموجودة ويجوا بعضنا عندهم ولا للمهدية لأنه ما عندنا تاريخ نظرنا به ولا نتكلم ولا نتباهى ولا نتفاخر به في وطننا I think that um, uh, he has uh, given to um, uh, the uh, Muslim people a sense of the power of people's power that uh, states and empires and so on are meaningless when confronted with the uh, mobilization of a determined people.